Now, if I had been following the titles that I was using like I did last September, the title of the message this morning would be Change Your World, and it is that. Remember, we started off with He Changed the World, and then He Changed Your World. Now we're looking at Change Your World. It's interesting when we're dealing with titles. You know, Wayne sometimes talks to me about, you know, you got to get something that will really grab them. You know, just, you know, the death-defying facts of the Bible. This really does the job. Darkness or light. I want you to think about that title. Because it's a choice. And I hope and pray that what we see, it's a choice each and every one of us makes. Not just coming to the light for salvation, but beyond that. Think about it clearly. Darkness or light. The passage that we're going to be going to, and I'm going to have you go there in a moment, but there's one other place that I'd like for us to go. The passage that we're going to be going to, it encapsulates so well all the hatred, all the divisiveness, everything, the bitterness, the animosity, everything that our society is going through today. The three verses that we're going to look at, literally, I mean, it spells out what we're looking at today in America, in the world for that matter. But before we get there, I want to share you share with you something that I read this morning in my devotions. Would you please go to the book of Leviticus? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. I want you to go to Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6. Robert, is that the little boy? Wow, he has grown. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. Hey, he's going to do fine. He's going to be fine. It's good, to, it's good to see you, friend. Really good to see you. You know, you get, into, you get into the book of Leviticus, and sometimes, you know, we think, well, this doesn't apply to us. And by the way, praise God for the salvation that we have in Christ. He is the fulfillment of it all. Amen? Rejoice in that. But you know, there's times you're, you're reading along and then God gives a verse. And it's like, wait a minute, back up. I have got to see that again. I shared this with you years ago. I read it this morning. I want to read it to you again. In the middle of all the detail that uh, Moses is receiving from the Lord concerning the um, uh, concerning all the the animal sacrifices for which you know for whatever you know which sin he says this you're in Leviticus six go if you would please to verse thirteen now this fire that he's speaking about is the fire where the sacrifice is made. And he says this, The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. I want you to think about that. And rejoice in two things. Number one, there will never be a time when, the, when God's forgiveness and mercy go out. There was always a time, there was a fire there. If a Jew came, an Israelite came, and they had a sacrifice to bring because of sin, the fire was there. It never had to be kindled. It will never go out. But while we're rejoicing in that, let's rejoice secondly in this. There must never be a time when the desire and the act of confessing sin and forsaking it goes out. 
May it never be a time when we quit praying. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Because with, when that takes place, what do you have? You have a heart that becomes more and more calloused with sin. And there's a deadness that comes up. Remember, Romans 6.23 was written to the Christian as much as to the unsaved. The wages of sin is death. You sin, Christian, and the stench of death is around you. Listen, it's not this. You don't lose your salvation. But the power is gone. The light is going out. So praise God that the fire would never go out when Israel was there in the land and as they wandered through the wilderness. Praise God the fire never went out. If somebody had sinned to confess, they could come. But at the same time, may there never be a time when we get so hardened about our own sin. Are you listening? That means we are keeping short accounts with the Lord. That means we are constantly, Lord, again, search me, O oh God. This morning, I want us to go back to John chapter 3. And would you please do that? John chapter 3. Now, last week, last week, we looked at these things. Number one, the visual of his purpose. The visual of the purpose of God. And remember who is speaking here. We're talking about Christ. Verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the visual of his purpose. This is why Christ came. And that lifting up the serpent that Moses did in the wilderness, when they sinned, when Israel sinned, that's the visual he's trying to explain to this man, Nicodemus, this is what this pictures. Then there was the vastness of his love that we saw. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the vastness of his love. Then there was the intent, and by the way, the intensity of his benevolence. Verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, remember this verse, but that the world through him might be saved. But then in saying this, it's interesting what now the Lord is going to say. He's coming. Yes, he has come as God come in the flesh. He is 100% God but he's also 100% man. But when he speaks here, he's looking at us like he's looking at Nicodemus, and he's saying some things as the creator, as the God of heaven, that we need to hear. Now again, last week, we looked at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now I want to tell you something. We're going to be getting a little bit deeper into this text. I pray that it speaks to all of us, but I guarantee you, if you understand, if you will listen and seek by God's grace to grasp what is going to be said in the next three verses, not only will you understand why we are in the mess we're in today, but you'll also understand why sometimes we're in a mess. And then at looking at the unsaved, it's like, Lord, why don't they, why don't they hear it? You'll hear it. You'll understand it. But bottom line, what you're going to see this morning is you're going to see the intensity of the spiritual warfare. So again, I hope and pray we're ready to hear his 
word. First of all, I want you to see clarification. Clarification. Look at verse 19. Jesus again speaking. He's giving clarification on what he said, not only in verses 16 and 18, but especially in verse 17 and 18. And this is the condemnation. This is the judgment. Jesus is giving a direct answer to Nicodemus. Think of it. Think of this moment. The God of heaven is looking at man and he says, this, I'm about to explain it, this is the condemnation. I am speaking as the God of the universe. I am speaking of as creator, as sustainer. I am speaking as God come in the flesh. So the first thing he brings is God's illumination. In clarifying, he brings God's illumination. Look, this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. I want you to go, keep your finger there, just go back a couple of pages. I want you to go to John chapter 1. Look at John chapter 1, verse 4. John chapter 1, verse 4. John writes, in him was life, and the life was the what? The light of man. Now, who's he speaking about? Christ. Look at verse 5. And the light shineth in darkness. Who is the light? The light shineth. Jesus, the light, the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not, comprehended it not. Now, we've got to think of what humanity is like. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are reticent about the light, and we're going to see, especially in the Greek, in just a little bit, we're going to see what that means. But he says, the darkness comprehended it not. And then he goes on to say, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Why did the light come? This reason right here. That all men might believe. Believe in what? The light and what the light was going to do. John the Baptist was not that light, verse 8, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, Jesus, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. God himself came to dwell with man. Now, now just stop for a second. Say, Preacher, I've heard this so long. Praise God, I'm glad you have. Let's think about it. Because you know something? We can get callous too, can't we? You know, sometimes we've got to stop and we've got to remember, what is it that I'm looking at here? God came on earth. I'll never forget when my wife and I were standing in the middle of the synagogue there in Capernaum. Now, I know it wasn't the exact floor that he was standing on. That had been replaced a few hundred years later. But I was in, we were in the very place, the very spot, where Christ was, where he taught. And I'm thinking, oh my soul, this is amazing to think about. It. Jesus, God come in the flesh, was here. But then again, where two or three are gathered together in my name, he says, there am I in the midst. So let's think about that. Go back to John chapter 1, look at verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now go back to John chapter 3. Think of that. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. We're going back to verse 19. Now he had brought, he had brought us his illumination. Light has come into the world. Now we're going to see what we just read in John chapter 1, verse 11. 
He came unto his own, and his own received him not. There's clarification, and this we're seeing God's illumination, but now we're going to see man's renunciation. And men loved darkness rather than light. There is an explanation here that we all need to understand. The world hated Jesus. The Creator was rejected by the creation because of sin. Jesus, as we read, is the light. He is the truth. Now that revelation shines in the hearts of mankind. When Christ came, he was the true light. Though light had come and shone the, on the realities of who Christ is and man's need of him. Now think of this. Though he who was light came and shone, he being the true light, man still rejected him. Let me give a little bit more illustration there. Why is this that took place? Men loved darkness rather than light. You see, when they loved, they loved the darkness with their intelligence. They're just not stumbling. Do you recognize this? Mankind and his sin is going to choose darkness without God drawing us. And by the way, he draws all of us. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There's not a place where his voice is not heard. That psalm goes on to say, understand this please. The light shineth in darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. They loved the darkness. They made a deliberate choice. And it was done for a deliberate purpose. Whoa, well, now preacher, wait a minute, that's not me. Hang tight, please, let's continue. But you've got to understand, and especially after seeing the testimony of everything that took place in all the Gospels, and for that matter, when we look at our world today, the majority of mankind hears the Gospel and they say, no, no, no. The darkness, catch this, please. The darkness is not the mere absence of light. Now, in our world, you know, like if you've gone into a cavern and you've done one of those tours where they'll take you into a cave and then they'll turn out the lights. And I mean, you can't, you know, you can put your hand right here and you can't see your hand. That's not what this is talking about. There's darkness as in an absence of light. This is more than that. The darkness that is sp being spoken of here, it is the hostile power against the light. Why do you think we see what we see in the world today? Are you listening? When sin comes, it isn't just coming to say and say, well, you know what, I just, I just choose to do this. Well, yeah, but the Bible says that's sin. Well, I understand that, and I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't believe that. No. If you stand for righteousness, there is a hostility towards you. How dare you try to put on us your ideas? They do it, don't they? And they're going to continue to do it. They do it on television. They do it in entertainment. They do it in print. They do it on the internet. Folks, it isn't just a choice of door number one and door number two. When wickedness came, it set up a hostile environment for that which is righteous. And it's happening today. That's why when men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil, well, we're going to see that. It's the specific power of sin and death that actively wars against the light. And friend, you cannot, you absolutely positively cannot have a truce with that which wants to kill you. 
You can't do it. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear. As the light is the reality of God, Jesus Christ come in the flesh, his love, his mercy, his grace as that light is, so is the darkness in direct opposition. All the unreality of the truth of God that mankind believes is wrapped up in that darkness that hates the light. Think of it. This speaks of a definite choice. It is not just, again, door number one, door number two. It's worse than that. This is that which is, again, hostile. So, in clarification, what Jesus says in verse 19, we see, number one, God's illumination. Number two, we see man's renunciation. I want you to see, number three, sin's manifestation. Sin's manifestation. Look at the last part of the verse. Because their deeds were what? Evil. How evil? We're going to see. These that were there at this time when Christ was on earth, the majority of them, unless they were able to get something from God, the, rejo- the majority of them refu- refused to look to Christ as the Jews had looked to the brass serpent that Moses had. These people that rejected Christ, they were staking their very souls on this. I am not going to listen There is, they realize, now, in eternity, there was something that went within them was unreasoning and unreasonable and telling them, don't listen, don't hear it. Why was this that they were doing this? What does light do? It exposes. Again, you get into that dark place, you turn the lights off. You get into that cave, you get into the closet, wherever you want to get into. But when the lights go out, what's what's simply put? You can't see. Now, often, that's not a good thing. But for the sinner, that's the thing that's desired. Because their deeds were evil. Sin's manifestation is this. It is in direct conflict with the righteousness of God. And so when the light came in Christ, and remember, it's Jesus himself that is standing before Nicodemus and telling him things he did not understand. But he's going to. And we will too, if we will listen to him. But there's a clarification going on right now. And we need to catch it. We need to see it. Listen, when it says their deeds, this is what it's not talking about. You know, we we, we get stuff on the internet at times through this thing called the neighborhood. You know, there was a porch pirate that came and stole some of my stuff, and, you know, somebody came along, and they were looking in my windows, and really a weird, creepy thing, you know, going on. You read some of that stuff, and you think, man, that is so sad. This guy just the other day said, you know, somebody came through and slashed my tires. Uh, What was it, uh, yesterday, Ed, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I think you posted something like that. Somebody came through, they had a bad day at school. A young man had a bad day at school over here in Antelope. So on his way home, he decided to vandalize about a dozen cars. That guy is going to learn what a really bad day is. This is not talking about random acts. When it says their deeds, these are not individual scattered deeds here and there, you know, I did this, I did that. 
This is the inner nature. This is what they are made of. Remember when you go to Romans chapter 3 and the Apostle Paul between verses 10 and verse 18, he lists what mankind is about and you're going, wow, whoa, woo, oh man, look at that. That's exactly what's being talked about here. Because see, in all of us, our deeds outside of Christ are evil. But these are people that embrace it, and this is how they desire to live. And the less light there is, the more they are bold in their evil deeds. Are you catching what I'm saying? This is why we as believers need to be salt and what? Light. Whose light? His light. But let's keep digging a little bit further. We're not just talking about singular acts of gross immorality. We're talking about ungodliness, not with God at all, self-righteous, even religious perversions, carnal and material religious hopes, all of that. These things that are going on there, what he's saying is, this is what I'm all about, talking about the carnal person. Unbelief never means, now listen, Unbelief never means that man cannot see the light. Unbelief never means that man cannot see the light. The light cannot be charged with deficiency. Well, you know, the light just wasn't bright enough. Now watch this. Please catch this. Well, preacher, what about the ones that are living all over the world and they never hear the name of Jesus? The heavens declare the glory of God. Friend, I want you to understand this. Every individual that has ever lived or lives today, God has given light that they can make a choice on. I'm going to believe my Bible. And the Bible says what it says right here. Mankind will make a choice. He might get this much light or this much light. And by the way, to whom much is given, much shall be required. But my God is holy like we just read, or like we just sang about. And God will give light. Now we are to be light bearers, salt and light. Amen? We can be and ought to be part of that which shines. And the fact of the matter is, we haven't shined enough. But unbelief can never be attributed to he who is light. He gives sufficient light. Man, when he sees the light, however God gives it to him, either goes after the light, as we'll see, or he rejects the light. The Jews had the prophets. The Jews had the scripture of that time. And by the way, it's interesting to think about today. There is no nation on earth like America that has Bibles with them. None. Are we accepting or are we rejecting? See, we either go towards the light or we go away from it. Light or darkness. Everybody goes through that battle, and it will not end until we get to glory. There is the light indeed of salvation, but it continues, and so will we. So, number one, we've seen clarification. Number two, identification. Now, in describing this, let me, let, let, let me bring this up real quick. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, 
who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Hinder it. That's not what we want to do. I also want to bring this up. The trouble that we are about to continue with is this. The trouble is not intellectual. It's not that man cannot grasp it here. Are you listening? It's moral. I want my sin. When we were back in Washington, D.C., Pastor Paul Chapel was telling about how he and a few other pastors, after they had been in a meeting, they went to that great place of fine dining in America, Denny's. Now, you know something? I personally like Denny's. I remember when myself and the guy, a good friend of mine, is going to be at my wedding, we're getting ready to go down to Southern California. We're going to Santa Maria. I'm going to get married. And we decided to stop. And I got one of my favorite meal, Grand Slam. Back then, you know, two pancakes, two bacon, two scrambled eggs, two bucks. I like it. But I'm going to shut up now because y'all are getting hungry and i got to finish this message. Pastor Chapel, he was uh, with R.B. Willette. R.B. Willette is not known for being timid. So they get out of their car and they're walking into Denny's and parked there at Denny's was a Bentley. Now that's not a Volkswagen. You know, you're not going to... That, <laughs> That will never be in my driveway. I mean, he said, it was an incredible car. And so they walk in to the restaurant, and here's this guy. I'll stop there. Here's this guy, and he's sitting there in the, you know, in, in the booth, and he's got his arms around two beautiful young ladies. R.B. Willette gets out a gospel tract and hands it to him and says, here, you need this when it comes to dealing with your sin. Well, the guy took it and he looked at him and he says, I love my sin. See, it's moral, not intellectual. Willette looked at him and said, yeah, you love your sin till you die. That's the case. It's moral. So now let's go from clarification to identification. What Christ describes here is two people. Watch. Look at verse 20. This is the carnal heart. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. The moral reason that prompts that choice, remember, it's moral, not intellectual, the evil work from which he will not separate does not let him rest, but make him hate and war against the light. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. When we go down to the Capitol, the majority of the legislature there hate what the Bible is telling them. You go door to door, you talk to somebody, and the majority of the people despise what God is saying in the Word of God. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Are you listening? This, first of all, the first person he talks about is the carnal heart. Now, it's interesting. There's two words here for evil. The first one, there in verse 19, talks about that which is wicked. But here in verse 20, for everyone that doeth evil, the Greek word that's used there, it means worthless. For everyone that does things that are worthless, that in the end, it, doesn't, it does nothing for the person. There's no benefit to it. For everyone that doeth evil, that kind of evil, hateth the light. But then he says this, neither cometh to the light. Now again, this isn't light as in daylight. This is the light. This is Christ. This is the light of divine truth. Remember, that's who Christ is. He was full of, again, John chapter 1, he was full of grace and truth. 
with the person who does these things, there is no neutral ground. There is no, well, you know, I could accept him or reject him. No, no, no. Listen, they hate it. By the way, there is that which is in our heart that does the very same thing. That's why you and I have struggles outside of the power of God with our flesh. Amen? Amen. It's there, folks. Now, now we got to start understanding what the Lord Jesus is saying to Faith Baptist today. Because it just doesn't stop with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is hearing things that, to put it in today's vernacular, are blowing his mind. Praise God, he became a believer. But for right now, let's also understand what's being said to us. He hates the light, neither comes to the light. The light is there. This individual that he's describing, the light is there. He knows it's there. It's there for him. But he is deliberately avoiding it. He hates the light. He dreads what the light can do. Just like sometimes we get sin in our lives and we dread what might happen if we come to the Lord and we say, you know what? I've sinned. See, this is what we've got to understand. This speaks to us just as much as it does to the unsaved. Christ is talking to Faith Baptist as much as he was talking about Nicodemus. Now, if you don't believe that, you're missing a lot of things when you read your Bible. You're missing it. And it will cost. So please, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. There's clarification. Now there's identification again. So there's the carnal heart. Lest his deeds should be reproved, not merely reproved, but shown to be worthless because of the darkness. And yet they choose the worthless, but they don't want to know what it really is all about. That's why they hate the light. That's the carnal heart. Look at the Christ-bearing heart, Look at verse 21. But he that doeth truth, literally, he that doeth the truth, cometh to the light. It doesn't say he that does things good. There can be good things that you do. You can help people across the street. You can feed the neighbor's cat. You can do good things. But that doesn't mean that you're doing the truth. The truth is what came with Christ. The truth begins, well, you'll see it in just a little bit. But it is all wrapped up in who and what Christ is and what he is seeking to describe to Nicodemus, what he has done, again, starting and the first part of John chapter 3, and continuing to now. Let's continue with the Christ-bearing heart. He that doeth the truth, literally, cometh to the light. He doesn't, he's not repulsed by it. He, he, He doesn't hide from it because of what it would do. What he's doing is, is he's coming to it, that his deeds, why? His deeds may be made manifest. You see, what he has done, and every person that comes to Christ, they recognize their need, they recognize who Jesus Christ is, and so what they're doing is they begin to come to the light. Because see, the light is showing them what needs to take place. The light shows them they're a sinner. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, including them. And he recognizes his need, and he continues to the light. And he trusts Christ, and he comes to him and begins to grow. Why? That his deeds might be made manifest. You see, the verb manifest here, 
requires that what is made manifest be stated. His deeds are made manifest. Look again, that they are wrought in God. The Christ-bearing heart, the one that comes to Christ, who places his faith in him, he's coming, and the fact of the matter is, that which is being done in him is not what he's doing. On the one hand, you have the carnal heart, and as he's walking away from the light, he is embracing the darkness. He is embracing what sin does, and the fact is that the more he embraces it, the more he hates the light. But the person who comes to the light, who the Holy Spirit speaks to. Let me ask you something. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Say amen. amen. That's who he's talking about in verse 21. You've come to the light. But you know, that's a continuous thing. The most miserable person on earth. Listen to me now. The most miserable person on earth is not the person who hates the light and he's walking to the darkness because he's still sitting there with his arms like this going, I love my sin. The most miserable person on earth is the person who has recognized what the light does and they're going towards the light and then they quit. They stop. Because you know what? Satan is still the great deceiver. And the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked to the point of who can know it. Because, see, the darkness that hates the light is still talking to you. It's still drawing you. Are you listening? Yes. Folks, it's, it's not because of me. Listen, this, this is Bible. And when our Bibles are open and we're listening to the Word of God, we best listen because there's a reason why we're hearing this today that they are wrought in God. Up to that point, he was in sin. It was worthless, but now he's trusted Christ and what God is doing in him. Hey, remember, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen, right? Amen. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's it right here. There comes the point where there is remorse and repentance. The word repentance simply means to turn. We're turning from the darkness and we're turning to the light. That's what's taking place. Once the light has come, he is able to come to it. You see, there is that time when the light comes. It might be just a little bit, but the fact of the matter is, it has come. And the person realizes, because of the light, his condition, the worthlessness of his sin, and the fact that he is doomed. By the way, they know it. The wicked one knows it. So they turn... And they start moving to the light. You know what God gives them? More light. And they continue. More light. And they continue. More light. And it goes on and on and on. Early in his ministry, and I'll close with this, Early in his ministry, Jesus painted a portrait. He painted the greatest picture of the individual that we just talked about. I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I just, I, I was reading this one time. And I thought, wait a minute. Back up. 
what did I just read? Now, I had studied the Sermon on the Mount. Probably many of you have as well. And by the way, when I say this, there might be some of you going, yeah, I remember when I came across this or I read about it and somebody shared it. But for those of you that haven't, I want you to see this. Jesus is about to speak. Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, Matthew writes, he, Christ, went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, look at the first thing that Jesus says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I went, whoa, hold on. Let's go back to verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know who the poor in spirit is? Let me tell you who the poor in spirit is. The poor in spirit is the one, the light shines, and all of a sudden he realizes what I'm doing is worthless. I am empty. I am poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. When they see this and they turn to the light, guess what they're going to get? The kingdom of heaven. It doesn't stop there. I want you to stop and consider the journey of a person that turns from the darkness to the light. I want you to think about your journey. Look at verse 4. First of all, there's the poor in spirit. Secondly, blessed are they that mourn. You see, the person, when he realizes his sin and its worthlessness and the fact that he's lost, there's mourning. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Wasn't it great to find out that God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son? Look at verse 5. Blessed are the meek, the ones that humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. I am coming to you, Lord. I'm confessing my need. I'm confessing my sin. They shall inherit the earth. They're going into eternity with him. But then look at this. That person has now changed. Remember the light? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness. I'm walking to the light. They shall be filled. As long as they are going after the light, they are filled. Not to the point where they don't want anymore. They keep going and going. Ephesians 3, knowing the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. You just don't get to the end of it. You keep going. This is the individual that has recognized the light shined in darkness. And in this case, the person answered, this is the Christ-bearing heart. This is the person who recognized John 3.16. This is also the person who recognized John 3.18, condemned already. Here I am. What shall happen to me? Hey, I can go towards the light because the light is calling. Look at the next verse. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. This person is becoming like his Lord and Savior. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He is walking because of his, the righteousness he desires. He's walking in purity. He's been purified by the blood of Christ. Blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, wait a minute. Keep your finger there. Go to Romans chapter 5. Keep your finger, finger there. 
Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know who the peacemaker is? He's the soul winner. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. They're like him. They are bringing the message as well. They are salt and what? Light. But now watch this. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. By the way, notice how he went from they to ye. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You know who's saying that? The people who love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. We have just witnessed somebody in Matthew chapter 5, the testimony of someone that Jesus Christ gave that says, you know what? I'm watching, I have turned to the light, I'm going after it, and now that he has become a light bearer, the darkness is after him. And they hate him. And they will hate and do hate us. Right now, there is someone that is running for president of the United States before an LGBT audience. I, by the way, we need to pray that more and more of these people see the light. They can see the light. 1 Corinthians 6, and such were some of you, but you're washed. How did that happen? You saw the light. You saw the light. That's who this person is right here. The people that are speaking, not just just that group, but other groups, they are inflaming the hate for the light. Because it's not just neutral ground. There is a hatred in the darkness. That's the journey. That's the journey. Now let me ask you, are you taking that journey? I want to ask you, and this is between you and God, but I'm going to ask the question. Are you drawing toward the light? Eternity will show. It starts with salvation, but it continues in our life. Do you recognize that? Let's go back. Just read those three verses once again, and then we'll close. John chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation. Remember, Christ is speaking. This is the condemnation. That light is come into the world. Has light come into the world? Have you trusted the light? Say amen. Amen. And men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were wicked. They're evil. They have an active hatred and revulsion to the light. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth literally the truth not just good, but the truth as it is in Christ. He cometh to the light. That his deeds may be made manifest, it's what he desires. God is glorified that they are wrought in God. Let's pray.